Hello and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, I'm going to talk about the electric system of the King Air 200 and B200. Before getting into it, uh, please consider to like the video to support my work. Right now, I'm not making any money from my videos, but with your support, I may one day. The aircraft is equipped with a 24 volt battery who provide enough power to start the engines. The King Air is equipped with a receptacle to allow power from a ground power unit to be connected. The engines are equipped with a starter generator. The same device will be used to start the engine and when started will provide electric power to the aircraft. A volt load meter equips each generator and are located on the overhead of the captain's side. For the model BB1632 and after, you will have a battery ammeter to indicate the charge or discharge of the battery. The main circuit breaker panel is located on the co-pilot side and the other panel is located on the captain's side under the fuel gauges. I believe the landing gear circuit breaker is the only circuit breaker who is beside the actual system control. You can also find some switches who also act as a circuit breaker, like the stall warning switch. This switch can be recognized by a number on it, indicating the amount of amperage. The battery is located in the right hand wing between the fuselage and the engine cell. Two types of battery equip the King Air. The traditional lead acid battery, who was installed after BB1631, provided 24 volt and 42 amps per hour. And the nickel cadmium, who equipped the King Air 200 and B200 before BB1632, who provide 24 volt and 34 amps per hour. Before operating the King Air, the battery must be at least at 20 volt. Do not connect the external power if the battery should less than 20 volt. The battery will need to be recharged or replaced before the flight. If the voltage is at or above 20 volt, the external power can be connected to recharge the battery. For the King Air BB1632 and after, are equipped with an amateur. For this aircraft, the pilot must check the charge current is under 10 amps. When connecting the external power, first check the avionic master switch is off, then turn the battery on. Check you have at least 20 volts on the battery. When using an external power, the GPU must provide a maximum of 1000 amps with a 300 amps continue. An annunciator light indication of the external power is connected. Most King Air 200 series will show a connection, but will not be able to tell you if the power is going through. The only good visual to know if you have enough voltage will be the voltmeter. Both battery and external power are connected to the main battery bus. From this bus, the power is distributed either to the starter generator or to the isolation bus who connect to the rest of the aircraft electric system. When the pilot turns the master battery switch on, he actually energizes the relay through the hot battery bus. The hot battery bus also energizes the cabin light, who can be operated from a switch located by the floor on the left hand side of the main cabin door. This relay connects the battery to the main battery bus, and then the isolation bus. Through the isolation bus, the battery will be able to supply the aircraft electric system. And last, a standby battery to provide power to the electric standby instruments, if equipped. The standby battery is automatically recharged through the standby instrument bus, who is powered by the isolation bus. The PT6 is equipped with a starter generator. This starter will spin the turbine to create enough compression to start the engine. When the engines are running, by turning the generator switch to reset and on, the starter becomes a generator, who can provide 30 volt and 250 amps. It is regulated for an output voltage of 28.25 plus or minus 0.25 volt, with a continuous of 250 amps. To control the starter generator, a free position switch with on for initial and start, off position, and starter only position to run the engine without the intention of starting it. When the switch is moved to initial and engine start position or starter only, the pilot will energize the relay who will power the starter. 
When the engine is started, the pilot will move the switch to off position, cutting the power from the battery. The generators has a time limitation during start. This limitation is known as a 4060, 4060, 4030. If for some reason the engine is not started in the 40 seconds, the start must be rejected. A 60 second of a cooldown must be performed before attempting another start. Let's say you try to start the engine, but you have a no light start. You stop the generator before the 40 seconds. Then you wait a 60 second before attempting another clearing procedure of 40 seconds. The clearing procedure consists of running the generators on motor only to clear the fuel unburned in the engine. When the clearing procedure is completed, you will need to cool down the starter for 60 seconds before attempting another start. If after 40 seconds of running the starter, the engine is not running, you will need to wait now 30 minutes before attempting another start. Of course, at that point, you will be under the supervision of an AME. If you want to know more about engine start fault, check in the description below for the link to one of my videos about this subject. When the pilot starts the engine, it first moves the switch from off to initial engine start, providing power to the starter, who will create a compression in the turbine. When the engine is running on its own, the switch is moved back to off. When the generator switch is moved to reset, the residual power is sent through the generator control unit, also called GCU, to the generator shunt wheel. That will make the generator output voltage to rise. When the pilot releases the switch, it will spring back to the on position. Two things happen. The regulator circuit take over and controls the generator shunt wheel who maintain a constant 28 volt. The GCU will compare the aircraft voltage and the generator output voltage. If the voltage is in 0.5 volt, the line contactor will close and feed the aircraft electric system, including recharging the batteries. The GCU over voltage protection will protect the aircraft electric system by first trying to absorb the electric load and by disconnecting the generator when the voltage reach a maximum of 32 volts. If the output voltage increases without control but do not exceed 32 volts, the GCU overexcitation will activate. If the generator field reach a limitation value, the circuit will remove the affected generator from the bus. When the pilot do a split power or a run up, the generator will run at a different speed or will increase or decrease the output load. The GCU will sense this difference and maintain a load sharing which in 10% between the both generators. Both generators are connected in parallel, providing a constant 28 volt into the system, either with both generators running or if only one is operating. When both generators are online, the GCU will equalize the load level. When a generator fails to provide a minimum 28 volt, the current from the good generator will feed back towards the bad one. For example, if you shut down one engine without disconnecting the generator first, the current from the operating generator will feed back towards the other one. Or any other situation where one engine generator do not provide enough voltage. The GCU will sense this reverse current and will open the affected line contactor. The cross generator start consists on using the power from a running engine to help with the start. More you have compression in the turbine, less chance of a hot start is going to happen. To get more compression, you prefer having 28 volt instead of 24 volt going to the generators. The second reason is during a start, the generator is using a lot of amperage, which is creating a lot of fatigue on the battery. So that is why for any start, the use of a GPU is important. However, the GPU is not always available. So for aircraft model BB1444 and after, a cross-gen starter can be used to help the battery starting one engine. The idea is to use the power from the running engine to help starting the other engine. This technique cannot be used on a model before BB1444 because they are not equipped with a cross-start current limiter. Attention, do not confuse the cross-gen start and genesis start. Genesis start consists of using a generator of the same engine to start the engine. Genesis start must be avoided. 
When performing a cross-gen start, you begin by starting the first engine normally with the battery. When it's time to start the second engine, push the switch to initial and engine start. Wait for N1 with a minimum of 12%. Introduce the fuel, then on the opposite engine, push the generator switch to reset then on. When the engine is started, check the current limiters. Turn on the remaining generator. Two load meters are located on the overhead of the captain's side. By default, it shows the load from both generators. But by pressing the button by it, it will show the voltage. The voltage shown is not the output voltage of the associated generators, but the voltage in the electric system. You should always have the same indication on both voltmeters. When both engines are operating with the generators online, the GCU will keep the load reaching 10% of each other. If more than 10%, that means the GCU is not working properly. The load is the amount and percentage of power used by the aircraft. The maximum load limitation must be respected accordingly to the AFM. This limitation is due to the amount of air it needs to prevent an overheat. The current limiters are located on each side of the isolation bus. The primary job of the current limiters is to protect the electric system of the aircraft. During power transfer, a surge can happen, can exceed the maximum amperage the system can take. To prevent that, a fuse, current limiters, will blow before affecting any major systems. If both current limiters are blown, that will probably also mean a potential critical power failure. Before and during the engine start, the pilot will have to check if the current limiters are blown or not. By doing so, the pilot will check the voltage on both voltmeters. When the battery is on, the indication on the voltmeter should both indicate 24 volt, as the power will have to go through the both current limiters. If one current meter is blown, you should see 0 volt in one and 24 volt on the other one. And of course, 0 on both if both current limiters are blown. The same rule applies when the GPU provides an output of 28 volt. With the exception, you should see 28 volt instead of 24 volt. After starting your first engine with the generator switch on, you should see 28 volt on both volt meters. Note, if you start the engine with a GPU, you will not have any indication of a blown current limiters, as both GPU and generator provide 28 volt. So in this case, the current limiters will have to be checked after the GPU is disconnected. But for the situation where the battery start is used, before and after each start, the current meters check can be done. Which current meters has failed? Pause the video to try to figure it out. You know your left engine is running with the generators on. You will see 28 volt. However, the right volt meter should also show 28 volt. But you have 24 volt. What current limiters is blown? That means the power from the battery is going to the right voltmeter, meaning the right current limiters work properly. By consequence, the left current limiters must be blown. Same situation on the left engine is running with the generator operating. You see 28 volt on the left and 0 volt on the right. Which current limiters is blown? As usual, the left generator is running, so we have 28 volt. The right voltmeter should also have 28 volt from the left generators, but no power at all is going through. That only means the right current limiters must be blown. I am a visual person, and when I do my current meters check, it is what I visualize to figure out which one is failed. But a lot of my colleagues, it seems to be easier for them to remember the table. If you do not know already, a bus is not, in this situation, a transportation vehicle, but a bar where different systems are connected to it. Like the hot battery bus, who connects the battery to the battery switch, and also the main battery bus. The isolation bus connects the both generators and the battery, or external power, allowing the generators to recharge the battery. 
The left and right generator bus connect the generators to the main electric system, at the exception of the avionic and entertainment. All the major systems are connected to the dual feed bus, and we have four of them. The dual feed bus are fitted by both generators, allowing to maintain electric power in the event of a blown current limiter with a third generator. Each dual feed bus are protected with 60 amp current limiter and a circuit breaker of 50 amps on each side of the bus. The number one dual feed bus also provides direct power to the standby instrument lights and the essential bus. In the event of a total loss of power from the, from the generator, the aircraft battery should provide at best 30 minutes of power, plus another 30 minutes for the standby instruments. The essential bus provide power for navigation and formation on the captain's side only. If the dual feed bus number one is not powered, the isolation bus will still provide power through the battery, allowing the pilot to return safely. The standby battery is also recharged from the standby instrument bus, who itself is connected to the isolation bus. You will be able to find in a carriage a list of all systems connected to each bus. In my previous companies, they like to know which system is connected to which dual feed buses. For example, if you lose a left engine instrument, you will know this left engine instrument is powered by the number two dual feed bus. And on the number two dual feed bus, is connected the landing gear control. Me personally, I do not care to remember these details, as the QRH will provide all this information in time. Please consider to press the like button that it is a very easy way to support my channel and amazingly not hard to do. If you like my content, you can also consider to subscribe to it. I really appreciate your help. This is the end of this very simplified explanation of the electric system of the King Air 200 and B200. Fly safe and see you in the next video.